live with us on CBN. Hello, everyone. Hello. Welcome to Heavy Welcome. Rain. Yeah. We're going to have an amazing evening tonight. How many of you have raised expectation for what God is going to do tonight? Yeah? I don't know. I think that's that like sounds three really people weak. in the house. How many of you have raised expectations for what God has go is going to do for you tonight? Yeah? Because I am. I don't know about you, but I'm not satisfied. How many of you are satisfied here? Thank you. Amen. We want more of him. So have well, you're going to have to do us a huge favor because Linda and I feel a little bit lonely up here. So you're going to have to get up off your butts. Come on, get up off your butts. It's not TV. I can see you. Even though the lights are bright. I want you to come forward. And as you come forward, it's not just coming up to the front so, you know, we can dance with Jesus. This is where, like, anointing is thick up here, guys. Holy Spirit is thick up here. Amen. So come on forward. Make lots of room for your friends. All 400 of your closest friends up here. And I want you to do me another favor. Put your thumb out like this. This is just something silly that we do in our church. Those of you who have been here before know what we're about. This is no longer your thumb. Say, this is no longer my thumb. This is no longer my thumb. This is now my pint of Holy Spirit. This is now my pint of Holy Spirit. Or pitcher of Holy Spirit, I guess, or keg or barrel. Okay, and on the count of three, we're all going to take a big sip of Holy Spirit. Got it? Everyone's like, is she for real? I'm for real, okay? On the count of three, one, two, three. Holy Spirit! You can dump some on your friend as well. <laughs> more for you guys, more for you guys. Our prayer for you is that you're going to get so filled up with Holy Spirit during worship that the rest of the evening you're just going to be wasted, okay? We're going to be right along with you guys. Let's praise Him.
awaking their heart to life. I want you to picture that person standing in front of you even and speak to their spirit. Say, God is waking your heart to life. He's waking your heart to life right now. Is that cool? Let's lift our hands. Let's all lift our hands up to him right now. Keep coming, Father. Keep feeling us tonight, God. Just start to ask him to fill, him with that, fill you with that fire. God, fill me with the fire of your presence. Come on, cry out right now. Ask him. God, fill me with the fire of your presence tonight.
yourself more and more and more, Papa. Reveal your heart, reveal your character to each one of us today, God. into this song, you know what I'm saying? You guys look like you're asleep. I think your dinner is like sitting in your tummy. No? So let's celebrate. Come on, my peoples. Can we celebrate tonight? Let's be, let's be a little bit demonstrative in our praise. Oh, yeah. Because he picked me up and he turned me around and he placed my feet on the solid ground. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sing it out. Oh, yeah. I got love, joy, peace, and righteousness. 
because we're declaring the word of God. And we're declaring it over our lives and we're declaring it over each other and over our cities and our families and all our circumstances. So when you sing, I got love and joy and peace and righteousness and the Holy Spirit, the Bible says that there's life and death in the power of the tongue. And so as we sing that, it's actually a declaration and you're speaking into existence something that did not exist before you said it. <laughs> and by speaking it, you have access to it. Amen? So realize, let's realize together, that's actually hugely prophetic what we're doing here. We are speaking an existence into existence tonight. Amen? So close your eyes, let's sing it again. In every circumstance, I got love, joy, peace, and righteousness in the Holy Spirit. Start to spill out of your mouth. Come on, start to count your blessings. Start to declare his faithfulness. Declare it, declare it, declare it, declare it, declare it. Come on. All in this place, let's lift up a thanksgiving song to him. Come on, a thanksgiving song. Start to declare what you're thankful for. Oh, you've been so good to me. Any 
place my feet on the solid ground. Hallelujah. I want to celebrate a bit more. lift your hands. Every hand in this place be lifted high. God, we honor you. You are unfailingly good to us. <laughs> you are unfailingly good to us. Let that truth just wash over you. God, you are unfailingly good. No good thing do you withhold from him whose walk is blameless. And because of Jesus, that's me. <sighs> and you, so you are pouring all good things into our hearts, into our lives today, God. You are pouring all good things into us right now. So just start to receive. Start to receive right from the hand of the Father. Right from the hand of your God. Just start to receive from Him. God, I, I totally need grace for these circumstances. I need wisdom, God. I need boldness. I know, I know what you're calling me to, and it seems impossible. God, I need healing. Oh, yeah, there's tons of healing coming right now. Hey, there's just tons of healing falling like rain in this place. Let's just start to reach out. Just start to reach out, reach out, reach out, reach out. Healing of our hearts, healing of our minds, healing of our ankles and our knees. Healing, 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 healing. Healing of skin disease right now. Come on, reach out and receive it. Be a participant, be a participant. There's a buffet here. I receive, I receive from you, I receive from your goodness. Right now he's wiping away pain that would take years of therapy. Right now he's just wiping it away. Just let it go, shake it off. We shake it off right now. Shake every chain is broken. Every chain is broken right now. Come on, let's push in a little bit deeper. Let's push in a little bit deeper. Push in a little bit deeper. Come on, move, move past your distraction and, and move out of your comfort zone. Come on, move, move, move out of your comfort zone. Move out of your comfort zone. Come on, move out of your comfort zone. Come on, move out of your comfort zone. Move out of your comfort zone, come on. Move out of your comfort zone. Come on, move out of your comfort zone, let's go. Run out of your comfort zone, come on. Hey. More, 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 more. I must have more, God, I must have more. God, you're high, you're lifted up.
breathe them in, just breathe them in, just breathe them in. Take a big breath. was giving each one of us a grace, a grace to step out of our old self, step out from a place of self-pity, step out of a place of false identity into what God has for us. And I don't know um, if you're familiar with this, but there are these ads on, uh, on the subways of, of this homeless person stepping out into becoming someone new or, or this drug addict being stepped out. And I felt like, I, and I, Sarah and I both felt it was so spot on the word because we feel like what God has for each one of us tonight is his transforming love. What he has for each one of us is not only his redemption, but his transformation. And I also got this picture that went right with it of this beautiful Roman statue. You know, we look at it and we say, wow, how beautiful that statue is. But then I saw each one of us breaking out of the shells of that statue and coming to life. And I felt like what God is saying is, I no longer want you to dwell in the glory of the past. Because what I have for you is right now. What I have for you is here. What I have for you is not stagnant. It's movement. It's moving forward. And I feel like there are some of you in this room that are living in regret. And God is like, I am breaking that over you right now. No more regret. No more regret. No more regret. No more. And even the fact that heavy rain happens at the end of a year, I feel like some of you as the band has been leading you and like 
just sing your thankfulness to God or just sing from, from your heart your thankfulness for everything that he's done this year, you're struck more with what you feel he hasn't done or how the disappointments are still weighing on you. And there was something, there was a word that God really kicked my butt about a couple of years ago where he says, Sarah, do you know that I don't have pity on you? And I'm like, that sounds really mean. He's like, no, I don't have pity on you. I have compassion on you. You know how we talk about the passion of the Christ? How it moved him to die on the cross? How it moved him to do things that a normal human being wouldn't do? It's because compassion is the verb. It's, it's, it's kinetic energy. It's not static energy. It means I love you too much to come over and be like, I'm so sorry that you're down in the dumps. I'm going to let you wallow. He takes us from that place, and in his love and in his grief even for us, he dusts us off and he sends us on our way so that we don't have to be there anymore. And our hearts were just broken with the fact that sometimes in life things are difficult, and sometimes we'll get to the end of a year and we'll look back and all we'll see is things not to be thankful for. But I feel like God wants to break us out of that statue, out of that statue of the past. And he wants us to move forward into 2011 with grateful hearts and with hearts not full of pity, but full of his passion, of his life. Amen. Are you guys ready for Amen. that? Amen. Are you ready to shed that? Are you ready to shed it? Amen. And the, yeah, let's continue to worship. And as we do, say, God, that word is mine. I take that word. I take that word and I want to step into what you have for me for now, not just 2011, but for, tw for December 30th, 2010. I want what you have for me now and forward. Are you guys ready? Yeah? Yes. Let's worship. Jealous for me, loves like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. And all of a sudden, I'm unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory. I realize just beautiful you are.
was saying that if you came in here with an injury or with, you know, a pain that's been happening for a long time, if you can't hear, if you can't see, whatever it is, I feel like God's saying, check yourself, check yourself now. I feel like his life was just washing through this room, and I really feel like there's just a wave of healing that is just washed through this room. And if you have experienced a healing, please come stand over here. <laughs> Wes is. Wes, give a wave. Yes. If you've experienced a healing, we want you to come up to the front, okay? Check yourself, check yourself. We got words of knowledge earlier that there's somebody here with an ankle injury. That we feel like God really wants to heal you tonight. That could be for more than one person. We got words of knowledge earlier about skin diseases, that God wanted to heal skin diseases tonight. We got words that God wanted to heal people of depression tonight. That God wanted to lift off any kind of mental blocks that there might be. Even if you put it on yourself, even if you're the one who said, you know what, I'm not going to speak out. I'm just going to stop myself from speaking out. We got the word speech impediment. I feel like God wants to heal you. So if anybody, if you suffer of anything, if you have a cold, put your hands out. you wave of healing just wash through this room right now father continue what you're doing continue what you're doing god if you see somebody with their hands up because they're they're getting prayer put your hand on them send you they're beside you put your hand on them just ask god to heal them And even as they're coming up, guys, keep soaking it in, okay? What's your name? Timor. 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 Tell us what happened. Uh, my knee was hurting for like a while now. Like. I think Timor has some friends. Is that true? Yeah, okay, there we go. I thought so. Sorry, your knee. Go ahead, your knee. So my knee was hurting for like a couple of years, and it's affected my like sports and stuff. My left knee. Okay. And um, today, while I was like singing, and then I started like dancing and it, it, it was healed and it was better. So if you could say on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being not healed at all and 10 being like totally, it's totally t- the 10, a total 10. Do you want to jump, jump around a bit? Jump around. Yeah. That's awesome. That's what Jesus does. That's amazing. Why don't we have some guys praying for you over in the side? Can move you along. Do we have some more testimonies? We have our amazing uh, ministry team leaders are heading up testimonies. Don't be scared of the stage, especially if you've just been healed. It's kind of a big deal. Come on, man. Hello. The living God just touched <laughs> Wow, you. I feel short. What's your name? How are you? My name's Luke. Luke, and tell us what was up. Um, I walked with a cane. Oh, you're the one with the cane. There it is. There's the cane. <laughs> So you're not walking with a cane now, so what happened? Um, I said, God, you're here, you're healing, threw my cane down. So what, what was it that, that you needed a cane for? Um, I had ho- lateral Hoffa's disease. My knee was falling apart. Okay, his knee was falling apart, which you can admit is pretty bad. And then now, how does it feel? Scale of 1 to 10. Better than it was, that's awesome. Are you able to do anything that you couldn't do before? Nice, and you couldn't do that before? Okay, well, Holy Spirit, reach your hand out because this is like 100% participation. Right now, in Jesus' name, remember how Duncan showed us like, showed us the, the, uh, the sheet that we stepped on and we brought heaven? You're bringing heaven with your hand, okay? Holy Spirit, right now, we, we declare that Luke's knee is 100% healed. Father, no sign of damage anymore. God, in any way where he has felt pain or he's felt like he's been uh, withho- withholding himself because of pain, Father, we just take that off of him. He's your son. And Father, as your son, he gets 100% healing right now. Father, we thank you for your healing because you're so awesome and you're so big. <laughs> How's it feeling? Does it feel any different? As he just kept saying, he's like, it's awesome. It's awesome. Why don't we have some guys to soak you? Because I have a feeling this is going to, by the time you leave tonight, I feel like that's going to be 100%. It's true because you can feel it's a little bit swollen, but it's even coming down. That's good. Yeah. 
Let's have some guys pray for him. If there's some ministry team guys or cell leaders, we'll just have a blitz over on the side. Thank you very much for coming on. <laughs> he said, I'm in. <laughs> He's brave. Once you get on stage, you get brave. Oh, a girl. Yay, a girl. <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with boys. I just, you know, balance it out. Balance the equation. Your name, honey? Megan. Megan. And tell us what was up. Um, I've had um, a brain issue for about a year and a half now. I had to, I was at a Bible school in London, England, and I had to leave because I had to go have emergency brain surgery. Wow. Um, and I've suffered for a year with severe migraines and I haven't been able to jump and I haven't been able to do anything and I was able to dance up here oh my gosh. and I was I was released into dance two years ago at Fresh Twins and I don't have a migraine anymore. That's I don't amazing. have anything anymore. So. That's incredible. Wow. How many of you guys saw Megan dancing? I saw Megan dancing right up here, right? You never would have known. That's so incredible. The Holy Spirit, we just set her mind absolutely free from any bondage, from any cage, Father, around it. God, we thank you in the name of Jesus that migraine is defeated in the name of Jesus. Because, God, we don't need them. We're your children, and we are free. And he who is set free and she who is set free is free indeed. Megan, we thank you for your healing. That's amazing. What a great story. Why don't we have some girls like... Blitz you over in the side. That's amazing. Anybody? Any migraine sufferers? Any migraine sufferers? I'm one. No migraine sufferers in the house? Really? One? That's amazing. Not anymore. In faith. No. I want you to reach out because when there's... How many of you guys just had your faith rise like an extra degree because you heard that she was healed of migraines, right? So why don't you just reach out? It's a stupid little thing we do. Reach out and just grab it and say, this is my migraine healing. Or my healing. I was just saying, I, I have a personal vendetta against migraines because I get them sometimes. Or I used to get them sometimes. Your name? Aaliyah. Aaliyah. And what's, what's going on? Um, you said speech impediment, and I'm the biggest talker in the world, and uh, people are always like, huh? You can't be because I am. <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> Number one place right here. I, I have this thing where I, I don't open my mouth all the way, and I, I, people are always like, what? What did you say? And always especially when i want to talk about god i hear everything that i want to say out loud and i hear it in my head but i i can never say it out loud like exactly what i want to say and then you said oh god's healing speech impediments and i'm like in my heart i just feel it like going like that and like even right now i'm like in front of all these people and i'm speaking so well and i'm not even stumbling or anything that's so amazing <laughs> I love how God heals everything on the spectrum, right? Because he knows what's important to our hearts. So it can be something like, something that you know in your heart has been grieving you for a while. That is such an amazing testimony. It's funny, even as you were speaking, you know how God put, um, put that coal to the prophet's lips and he said like, now your, your mouth will be used as a tool, as a, like a weapon for the kingdom. And I feel like that word is totally for you. I feel like now he's like, open the floodgates for you and out of your mouth like in the same way that we're supposed to look like Jesus remember Duncan was saying that two-edged sword is coming out of his mouth and that's a word of the Lord and honey you have that on you you totally have that on you father I bless her with the ability to have words of knowledge and words of wisdom and speak them out and literally just divide spirit and 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 soul and father you will just be able to put your words in her mouth father <laughs> Open the floodgates. <laughs> There's no going back. <laughs> it's almost like the breaking of a dam with you, honey. It's like everything's been pent up, and now that it's open, there's no stopping it. <laughs> there's no stopping it. Ha! Amen. Yeah, absolutely. What we're going to do now, some of you guys are still like, that's totally awesome for those people who are brave to come up. How many of you guys still have some sort of, of injury or ailment or sickness in your body that you know of right now right that you know of right now and that can that also means like sicknesses of the heart and the mind like we're talking depression you're just like i'm done with it we're talking like addictions we're talking like cigarettes alcoholism whatever it is that you know you're like i'm done with it i'm totally done with that sickness i want you to put up your hands 
And guys, I need 100% participation, just like we did it before. I want you to stretch out the kingdom like that, that sheet that Duncan was talking about. And I want you to look around, and everybody with their hand up should have at least one person praying for them. But I know that we could have like five or six at this point. If you're standing around, your hand is not up, you're the prayers. Go. Find somebody with their hand up. It's very easy due to the fact that their hands will be up. Go find them. Go find them. Absolutely. Linda just remembered, just because, just because you have sickness in you, it doesn't cancel the kingdom. So if your hand is up and there's someone beside you with their hand up, you stretch the kingdom towards them too. And trust me, in the meantime, you'll probably get blessing shrapnel. What Linda calls blessing shrapnel. It will hit you. And pray like you mean it. Because guys, you should mean it. Ha. Huh. Holy Spirit, right now, we, we release healing ministry all across this place. People who never thought that healing could go through them. People who have never considered themselves to have a healing anointing. Father, I pray that you would fall on them right now in the name of Jesus. God, that this would not only just be a testimony for those getting healed right now, but for those even praying, that they would know that God is using them, that God has always been using them. Kingdom, be made manifest right now in this room. We're excited to hear about the stories, Father. We thank you in advance. Okay, let's just, let's pause for a moment. Pause, 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 pause. If your hand is up, if you have pain in your body and it's something that you can check, like Luke with his knee, for example, if it's something you can check, I want you to check it right now. And for any percentage of healing, I want you to jump up and down if you can. Jump up and down. I want to see some jumping. Any percentage of healing, 10%, 100%, 85%, or maybe just raise your hand and kind of shake it at me. Any percent? Nice. 2%? How many of you guys know you can't heal yourself 2%? Right? So it's 2% kingdom. It's 2% Jesus. That's pretty cool. 15%, 50%? Any hands? I can't really see very well up here, but... Yeah? Keep praying for a couple of minutes. Holy Spirit, we believe that this heavy rain is going to be a radical shift in people's lives. Not just physically for our ailments, but also for our hearts, Father, that we would know that you're on our side. That we will know that you are a good God, that you are a nice God, and that you're a healing God. We love you, Father. We love you, we love you, we love you. Again, check yourself. Check, check, check. People who are praying, make them check. If it's something you can check. If it's something existential, you can't really check it. But if it's something you can check, check your knee. Check your elbow. Check your head if you have a headache. Check your hearing. Can you hear better? Ch take your glasses off. Oh, that one's always a good one because people are like, oh, whatever. Oh, my gosh. <clears throat> And put up your hand, any percentage of healing. How many of you guys have felt healing in your body already? Hands up for healing, hands up for healing. Come on, give them a round of applause. This is amazing, their hands all over. Sorry, I'm just being healed by a coughing fit. <clears throat> That's amazing. There were hands all over. It's kind of cool because it's backlit, so it's just silhouettes of little hands all over. Isn't God amazing? Isn't the kingdom amazing? I mean, we, we talk about it like it is, but then suddenly when you can move your knee when you couldn't before, you're like, oh, yeah, okay, it really is amazing. <laughs> like, all right. Okay, I want you to hug the person next to you. Big bear hug. I don't care if you know them or not. Appropriate hugging. Appropriate hugging. <clears throat> You can get phone numbers later, just hugging his brothers and sisters in Christ right now. I want everybody to go find a seat. Find you can still be checking yourselves while you find your seat.
You can still be checking each other too, checking each other, checking to see if what difference, differences. Not checking each other out, just checking things out. <laughs> Whatever, it's a young adult conference. You guys are going to hook up as much as you want. That's fine. How many marriages have come out of heavy rain? We should have statistics on this. How amazing is our God? How amazing is he? Oh, I can't remember which psalm it is, but some of you may know. There's a psalm in the Bible that says, you know, those who don't know our God have idols and have gods that have ears but cannot hear, have eyes that cannot see, have hands that cannot reach out and save. But our God is a God who is alive. Our God is a God who saves. Our God is a God who sees not only you, but he counts the number of hairs on our head. How amazing is our God? Isn't he amazing? Oh, Oh my gosh, I feel so drunk on his love. Like, it's just phenomenal. Oh woo! If you want to give it a little, woo! 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 <laughs> oh man, there's no better intoxication than being intoxicated by the love of God and by the Holy Spirit. If you guys have your Bibles with you, or your Kindles, <laughs> or your iPhones, or your, or your iPods. iPads, or your Blackberries, or all your techie, techie stuff. I want you to turn to Romans chapter 8 with me, please. Romans chapter 8, which is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible for a very good reason. Romans chapter 8, less verse 12. It says, so then, brothers, we are debtors not to flesh. I'm going to read that in. So then, brothers, we are, not, we are debtors not to flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you live by the Spirit, well, let me read that one more time. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. <laughs> how, about, how about you all say this with me? All who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Amazing. How many of you are sons of God here in this house? Woohoo! Amen. Wow. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father, Abba, Father, <laughs> Daddy God. I love this passage because it starts off by saying that we are not debtors to the flesh so that we will live according to the flesh. I think it was a really good uh, friend, Jessica, um, who mentioned, who was, she was sharing one day about how God gave her the revelation that if Jesus took all of our sin and our debt on the cross, he not only took the debt of our wickedness and of our, of our sins, but he took even our financial debt. How many of you realize that if you belong to Christ, everything you have belongs to him too? How many of you know that? And how many of you know that not only has Jesus died for your sickness, for your pain, he's died for your financial freedom too? How many of you know that? Yeah? Amen. Amen. And it says here in this passage, it says, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But, by the, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of, of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. And I love this because so oftentimes, I don't know if you notice, but I realize so many attributes that we put on money are attributes that we should actually be putting on God. I mean, I mentioned one of them, like financial freedom, financial security, financial peace, right? It's amazing how there's all these slogans that are tied to money, and God is like, I have not called mammon to be your God. I am your God. I am your security. I am your freedom. I am your peace. 
And it's amazing how in Romans it talks about how we're not debtors to the things of this flesh and to the deeds of this flesh, but rather we are made sons. We walk in freedom as sons of God. We are no longer enslaved by fear. And I don't know about you, but I know for me, I freak out when it comes to finances. Sam and I, um, we subscribe to this department store website, email thing, where we get sales every day. It's brutal. (laughs) And one day, we got a sale in our email inbox that said, buy one piece of luggage, get two free. I know. And I don't know if any of you have ever shopped for luggage, but it is ridiculously expensive. So if you know, oh my gosh, buy one luggage, get two free. Sam and I freaked out, and like during lunch, we ran to the bay. This is the bay that we uh, subscribe to the website. And we like grabbed Hayes. How many of you know Hayes luggage, right? It has like the little lion, and it looks all fancy schmancy. And uh, it was super expensive. It was like $325 for this luggage piece. And we're like, man, that's so expensive. But hey, if we buy the same size three times over, that means we get it all for like 66% off. So we like wheel all our massive luggage to the counter and we're about to buy it. And as I'm pulling out my credit cards, I asked, is this good luggage? And the woman at the counter actually said, no, it's terrible. I have customers coming to me saying, I will never buy Hayes ever again. I'm like, are you serious? So as we talked, she started began to give me reasons why it was not good quality. And all of the luggage pieces that were good quality, just unfortunately not on sale. And she talked me out of a $400 transaction that day. And I went home, and my heart, my heart was palpitating. Like, <gasps> I almost made a $400 mistake. Like, it freaked me right out. And I realized that God was like, Linda... Be at peace because I am your financial security. I am your financial safety. I am your provider. It says here in Romans, it says that we have not, we are, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. How many of you know that little kids do not worry about whether or not the roll roll of toilet paper they're using is going to run out, right? How many of you know little kids don't worry if they don't eat, if they don't eat these carrot sticks, they may never get carrot sticks ever again. How many of you know that little kids never worry about the lights being turned off or not having a bed to sleep in, right? When you are in a place of trust with daddy God, everything changes, And I don't know about you, but for me, every time I place anything into the offering, for me, I'm declaring that God is my father. I am declaring that the spirit of mammon has no power over me. Bill Johnson, one of my favorite speakers, had a $5 bill in his pocket, and he said, do you know that I am a general? Do you know that you are a general? And every single dollar is one of your soldiers, and you declare where it should go, and you command what it should do, not the other way around. And I really want to speak to each one of you today that as you give into the offering, absolutely we take up an offering because we want to keep heavy rain free. Absolutely we take up an offering so that we can bless our speakers and our worship, and we want to be a blessing to the body of Christ. But even beyond that, today, I want to bless each one of you. If you, are, if you struggle financially in terms of being like, oh, God, like, I kind of trust you, but I don't really trust you, let this be a declaration that says, God, enough is enough. My heart belongs to you. My treasures are in heaven. My treasures are in you. Where moth or rust do not destroy. Where thief cannot come in and steal. How about let's close our eyes. Father, I thank you so much that as children of God, you give us an amazing opportunity to partner with you in the kingdom, that you give us an amazing opportunity to stand with you and give and be generous like our Papa. Father, I pray that today, as we are led by the Spirit on what to give, whether it be a dollar amount, whether it be, you know, the change in our pocket to writing a check for something that is obscene. Whatever it is, God, I pray, Father, that we would be led by your Spirit. We are led by your Spirit. 
And Father, I pray that today as we give and as we drop pieces of paper and pieces of metal into a bucket, that we would be defeating the spirit of mammon in our lives. We are saying, no, I am not a slave to fear. I am a son. I am a daughter. I walk in freedom. I walk in authority. I walk in knowing that my daddy God, my Abba Father, is my provider, my king, my Lord, my everything, and I will not fear. So, Lord, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done today as we give. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we're going to have people handing out buckets for you just on either end of the aisles. Feel free. There's also envelopes in front of you if you want to, uh, for tax purposes, if you're an American or Canadian, we can give you tax receipts. Um, it's kind of a nice little bonus thing. Also, if you want to, if you don't have cash and you don't have a check and you want to pay by Interac or credit card, you may do so uh, right at the welcome desk. We do have someone there able to uh, take that for you. It's good old technology. Can't get over it. How are you guys doing? Two of you are good. How many of you were here last night? Give me a woo. A woo. Okay. How many of you guys, this is your first night at Heavy Rain this year? Woo. How many of you guys, this is your first time at Heavy Rain ever, ever, ever? A big woo. No way! Welcome! Amazing. Actually, let's do a little poll, and we'll do it by woo, okay? A woo poll? A woo poll. Are we good with this? A woo poll? Okay. How many of you guys are from Toronto or the GCA? Okay, okay. Okay, okay, okay. Okay. How, okay. How many of you are outside of Toronto or the GTA? Oh my gosh. Okay. How many of you are from the province of Ontario? Okay. How many of you are not even from Canada? How many of those people are from the United States of America? No way. How many of you are saying woo to everyone? Seriously. <laughs> That's true. I didn't think about that. How many of you guys just like the sound of woo? Woo! Now it's just starting to sound like our, our youth conference, okay. freshman. All right. Yeah. Get out of here. Um, we have, if you've enjoyed the conference, if this is your first one or if this is your fifth one, how many years have we been doing this? Five years now? Um, you probably are already very much aware that we make available to you a USB stick. So that has on it all of the teachings that have happened, including workshops. So if you attended one workshop, but you wanted to bodily be in another workshop, or vice versa, if you wanted to be in two places at the same time and you weren't able to split yourself or clone yourself, for the low price of $29.99, you can buy a USB stick and listen to the other workshop. You know what? That actually is a low price. Because usually people it's say for the low price of $129.99, and you're like, that is not low. But $29.99, I can do. We used awesome. to make them available on, on CDs and DVDs, and the price was exorbitant, let me tell you. But then we were just kind of like, you know, we got with the times finally. I mean, like just like what, last year or something. Anyway, so now we have USB sticks, so you can like plug them in. You can share them, which is really handy. If you were in some of the workshops or speaking um, times and you're like, oh my gosh, this message is totally not for me. It's for one of my uh, friends. Like people go to the doctor and they're like, I have a friend who has a strange rash. You can give it to them if they want it. Totally. If you're like, this is totally for my mom. She needs to get with the times. You can give it to your mom. Yeah. And you be can a good son or daughter. email MP3s to your mom. Oh, we didn't really introduce ourselves. I'm sorry. I'm Sarah. And I'm Linda. And we both pastor young adults. I pastor at High Park Campus. And I pastor here with my husband at airports. What's so where is your husband? Uh, my husband is somewhere. Back oh, here. anyway. She has a very ha ha handsome husband. And I had that. My ha handsome husband is a guy who is right here. So, yeah, you know a little bit more about who we are. There you go. We have some also really exciting products, uh, not only the USB stick, which is really, really handy-dandy, but we also... Yes, please. I have Ivana White here, a.k.a. Sarah Aubrey Gasneo. Uh, we have an amazing... How many of you enjoyed the worship this uh, conference? It's been phenomenal. Phenomenal. We have, well, we're, only, we're featuring only two of the CDs, but they, Fresh Wind has several albums out, this being the most recent one. If you have not added this to your collection, you are seriously missing out. Can I please, please encourage you to grab one of these? And it is, honestly, the worship on this is so ridiculously anointed. Oh, my gosh. 
It's something you would listen to on repeat and on while you're soaking, while you're on the bus, etc. We also have the privilege and the honor of having one of um, our GTA's pastors, Bruxy Cavery. Um, how many of you heard so much about Bruxy? Like, he is such a blessing, such a blessing to the body of Christ. Um, and, oh, oh my, I can't even get started. We'll let you, we'll him, to, him talk tonight and you'll see. But he has a phenomenal book called The End of Religion. And how many of you know that when Jesus came on the earth, he did not come to create a new religion. Yeah? He, yeah. He came to bring transformation and salvation and relationship with God. So if you want to get rocked, if you want to get your socks rocked, you need this book. Okay? Absolutely. This is a great book, too, to have more than one copy. And no, it's not just because, you know, Brexy told me to sell lots of them. But honestly, you want more than one copy because you need a copy for you that you can mark up. Totally. And again, it's for that friend of yours who has that issue, probably will be answered in this book as well, so you can give it away as a gift. Also, your mom. I did it actually for Christmas. I bought one for my sister, and I bought one for myself. There you There's go. There's nothing wrong with my mom. I love my mom, especially if she's here. Hi, mom. Um, and now we have the great honor and privilege of introducing Bruxy. But wait, I need to give like a little preamble because Bruxy KV is the teaching pastor at the Meeting House, which if you live in the GTA and you are under the age of 30, you probably know very well. Uh, I have had the privilege of attending the Meeting House lots of times in Oakville back when there was just one campus. And now I believe there are six campuses, five campuses, Bruxy? How many do you have? Ten. I am so behind. <laughs> this just in, there are 10 campuses of the Meeting House. And Bruxy also was able to come to, um, uh, do any of you guys attend University of Toronto? Wait, Arendale campus in Mississauga? <laughs> well, I did, okay? And it's a pretty cool campus. Anyway, Bruxy came to speak at our InterVarsity group, and I was struck with the ability of Bruxy to be like on a stage talking to throngs of people, animated and charismatic as he is, and then talk to this like puny little group of about 20 of us little like nerdy university students, and he was just as personable and just as kind. So that really touched my heart. Ladies and gentlemen, Bruxy Cavey. You guys are so sweet. There is a really sweet spirit here. I really appreciate feeling like you have adopted me into your family for the evening. Thank you. It is really great. And, you know, I was just thinking of the scripture that you read. Um, it was, you know, for the offering from Romans, um, Romans 12, right? Romans 8, 12, that's, that's right. And even as it started out, something stood out to me. But then, brothers and sisters, we're under no obligation to the flesh to live according to the flesh. We're just under no obligation to the flesh to live according to the flesh. We're just under no obligation to the flesh. We just have no obligation to the flesh. We don't have to listen to what the flesh says. We're just like, I don't actually have to listen to you. You're not my boss anymore, right? Like, I fired you a long time ago. I quit, right? I, I just have no obligation to the flesh. I have no obligation to the flesh. And that stood with me because... Even earlier when you guys were singing, some people were saying that there are people here who wrestle with issues of the past and other things. And I thought, do you know, it's just so very true. Many of us are products of our past. We're products of our past. And I want to just drive home the point again that you have no obligation to your flesh. And the flesh includes everything that has happened to you thus far in your physical life. You have no obligation to that. That may be circumstances of birth, it may be your ethnicity, it may be a deformity, it may be who your parents are, your socioeconomic status, what your an ethnic or national background is, it could be your gender or your sexuality or things you have done or things that have been done to you and their continued effect from the past on the present, you just have no obligation to the flesh, you have no obligation to the flesh. So whatever anyone has done to you to define you as a victim, you have no obligation to that anymore. Whatever you have done so that you are defined as the victimizer, there is forgiveness, so you have no obligation to the flesh anymore. In fact, may I just say this to you very clearly, there's only one thing in your past, only one thing out of the totality of your past that need to define who you are. It is the birth, life, death, and resurrection again of Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that has happened to you up till this moment. This moment now is a moment of absolute freedom. Everything else in the past, you have no obligation to. Everything else in the past is something that you are free from if the one thing about your past that matters to you is Jesus. 
When that's the case, then the one thing about your future that matters. You see, the future now, you have no obligation to the flesh of the future. Your worries, your hang-ups, your concerns, your fears, you have no obligation to the flesh. You have no obligation to the flesh. There's nothing that can happen to you in your life, in the future, that need concern you. Because the only thing that matters in your past is Jesus, and the only thing that matters in your future is Jesus. Because we know what's important is where we've come from, and we also know where we're going. And if death is good news, then what else can get you down? (laughs) Really, once through Jesus you conquer the fear of death, what what mini fear or micro fear between now and the ultimate fear of death can, can or should concern you when the fear of death means nothing? So you're freaked out because you might not get the grades that you're going to get at that course. Well, so what if you don't get the grades you get at the course as long as you know you've tried hard? If you haven't tried hard, you pray for forgiveness, then you do harder. You try harder then, but that's fine. Then you cut the ties of the flesh and you move forward. But what if I don't get the grades? I might not get the job you want. What if you don't get the job you want? If I don't get the job you want, I won't have the income that I want. If you don't get the income, well, then I won't be able to have the future that I want. If you don't get that future, well, what if then if I'm not motivated my job? So then I get fired because I'm not motivated. So you get fired, but then I won't have any money. I don't have any money. I won't be able to buy food. I won't have shelter. So you don't have food and shelter. So then I'll die. That's great. Once you conquer the ultimate fear, every micro fear that leads up to it loses its power. The only thing about your past that matters is Jesus. The only thing about your future that matters is Jesus. And guess what? It should be no surprise. The only thing that matters in your present is Jesus. In this moment now, right now, there is no obligation of the flesh. There is no obligation of the flesh. There is total freedom in Christ now to push the reset bar- button and Barton, whatever that is, push the reset button and start again and start fresh. I hope that this conference for many of you is that fresh start, that new beginning where you realize, I have started, some of you honestly may know that this is true, in, you, you have an awareness that you have started to become a caricature of yourself. Have you ever noticed that you start behaving in ways and then there's the you who can step outside of you and look back at how you're behaving and say, I can't believe you're behaving that way. But now you're committed to the role. And you're behaving in ways that maybe you know you shouldn't. And there's a you that says, you know you shouldn't. But there's the you that says, I'm sorry, I'm, you know, it's all or nothing with me and now this is who I am. And you've defined yourself and you've become a crazy caricature of who you know you really are. Tonight, you can actually, the self that's the real you, your spirit, that is observing what your flesh is trying to do. The, the you that feels trapped, that says, look, I already have a reputation of being, being this kind of person, so this is who I am. I'm a screw-up. I'm this, I'm that. I just have to do it. Just leave me alone. All that thinking is the flesh, and you can be free from it. The only power that Satan has, that the flesh has over you, is the power of self-deception. The power to make you think you cannot get up out of your chair. The power that makes you think you cannot actually be a different person. You see, the power that tells you why bother because you can't keeps you from doing what actually in Christ you can do. So then you do not do it and you say, but I can't. Satan's power is the power of deception and he's a master at it. So he gets you to believe the lie that you are a person that you are not. And to forget that there's actually no obligation according to the flesh. You have no obligation. It doesn't matter what your background is, what you have done or has been done to you, you can start fresh in Christ. And so I am no longer a product of my past. I am a product of my future, and my future's good. And so now every day I'm just walking into the future that is secure for me rather than trying to overcome something that was done to me. This is a beautiful truth of the gospel and allows us then in the present to have peace, to have joy, to have the fruit of the Spirit. Now, we're going to be talking more about that tomorrow, what the Spirit is all about, what the fruit of the Spirit is, and how we connect and get filled up with the Spirit. That's going to be our emphasis for tomorrow. But tonight I want to talk to you about how, because this amazing gospel message is transformative, how God wants to partner with us to get that message out there. That's what we'll talk about tonight. Tomorrow we'll talk more about ourselves and what it means to be filled up with the Spirit, but tonight is about how we, once we are impacted by this message and realize this is life-changing, how we can then take steps to share it with others. We want to talk about the privilege of partnership, that God wants to partner with us to get the job done, to get the message out there. 
everything that God does, everything that God does is done through partnership, is done through relationship. God is love, says 1 John 4, 16. God is love. And love is an inherently relational concept. Love is, is relational. You can't have love. What I mean is you can't have love apart from relationship. If you were marooned on a deserted island, there are certain qualities that would help you survive. Hope would help you survive because it would keep you moving forward day after day instead of just laying down and giving up. Creativity would help you survive. It would help you build the hut and forage for food. Strength, perseverance, there are great human qualities, God-given qualities that would help you survive. Here's a quality that would be absolutely useless, love. If you're all by yourself and you're marooned for, you, you got this, you, and you want to get, and you got nobody, you're going to grab a beach ball and start drawing a face on it because you got to have a relationship, right? You, you're like, I got, I got something to, ah, and you have nowhere to go. You were wired for a relationship because you're made in the image of God. God is love. You are surrounded by the love of God. God is always wanting to relate to you. That means partnership is key. Partnership is central. And you're wired for the same partnership that God is, that he is all about. Uh, it, it's interesting that you can't escape the fact that you are a relational being because you're made in the image of love, because you're made in the image of God. You are made for a relationship. This is unescapable. The way you think, the way the human mind thinks, when you have a thought, when you work, you have what's called an inner dialogue. You have a voice that talks to yourself. You talk to yourself in your head and you work things out. You actually work things out relationally. Sometimes you just kind of become aware of the fact that you've been doing that and you weren't aware of it before that. Sometimes you're so involved with your inner dialogue relating that whatever external physical activity you were doing, you only wake up to the fact that you're doing that. Have you ever been driving and then suddenly realized, I'm driving? How many lights ago did I tune out of the fact that I am driving? Because in my head, I was chatting about whatever. We're so relational. Sometimes our brain goes, tell you what, we'll take care of some of the basics so the rest of you can go have a chat. You know? And, and then other times, <laughs> other times we, we go to sleep at night and our subconscious mind goes, yippee. Now what are we going to do? Now we're going to hyper-relate. We hyper-relate and we have a word for that. We call it dreaming. What is dreaming? It's when the, the mind says, now I don't have to think about the physical world anymore, where I step and all this stuff, and now I get to just totally tune out from that and I get to play. Oh, I get to play. And how do I play? I play pretend. I play pretend. I don't say, let's throw the pigskin, Bob. I say, no, I want to have tea and have friends over and I want to play pretend. And that's what we do. You be that and I'll be this and then we'll go, okay. And then you go and you do that. Your brain does this. You can't help but relate. So that even when you're unconscious, you're relating to yourself. Isn't that weird? You're so wired for relationship. <laughs> you're so wired for relationship that sometimes in your brain, your brain will subdivide and part of your brain will say, let's pray a, play a joke on the other part of the brain. And you'll surprise yourself in your dream. Have you ever had that? <laughs> Have you ever had a scary dream where something jumped out at you and you went, wow! Now wait a second. When that happens, who is scaring whom? <laughs> there is actually a part of you, because there's nobody else in there, right? I think it's you. There's a part of you that goes, shh, let's hide in the closet. <laughs> She'll never know. <laughs> and there's another part of you that comes home and has that ominous feel of, this is going to be a bad dream, I can tell. But like that, I think I'll hang up my coat here, and then I'll open up the closet. Wah! And the other part of you is going, <laughs> And then there's a part of you who wakes up and goes, that freaked me out. You are designed to relate. You can't help it. The question is, are you relating the way God has given you to relate, the best way possible, the way that leads to health of relationship between God and with others? This is community. This is what we're made for. You can't help it. You know, um, <clears throat> uh, Aristotle said that, um, sorry, Socrates my bad. I know you were about to correct me. Uh, Socrates knew this. He said, we are so wired for relationship, he said, and relationship is so important. He just knew this intuitively because whether Christian or not, we're all made in the image of God. You just have to do a little reflection and you can say, there are things that I learn about myself just by thinking a little bit and it happens. And, uh, and so Socrates said, we're so wired for relationship. He said, relationship is more important than just learning knowledge. 
He said so to his disciples, so therefore, I don't want you to write down any of my teachings, which is interesting. That was a principle of Socrates. Don't write down my teachings. Why, said Plato and the other disciples? Because if you write down my teaching, you could start handing it out to people, and they are just relating to the teaching on a piece of paper. But if you never write it down, they have to come to you and learn in relationship. And because relationship is what's most important, why would we ever want to take knowledge and separate it from personhood, put it on a piece of paper, or put it in a book and hand it around? And I said this in the workshop earlier, I'm really glad we got the printing press, and I'm really glad we got our own Bibles, but God never intended it to be a thing that I take privately over here so I can study by myself. He intended this to be something we gather around in community and breathe out to each other together. And so, you know, by the way, how do we know that Socrates taught this? Don't, t don't write anything down. Let it work its way out. The teaching go from generation to generation through relationship. How do we know he taught that? Because Plato, one of his students, was writing down everything he says. I love that. <laughs> and I wonder at what point Plato's like, oh, I like this. That's good. Oh, and don't write down anything I owe. Don't write down anything I say. <laughs> then even Plato, when he, when he published his writings... He wrote in a certain form, he called them dialogue, where he created characters that had conversations and we were invited into a story so we met people even while we read Plato. And isn't it interesting that when God writes a book, he didn't actually write a systematic theology textbook. It's not a book with flowcharts, how the Trinity works. It's not just, you know, what's, where's the chapter on? And then we, we have to look all over the place and look at stories and look at illustrations. For instance, grace, where do you go to find out about grace? All over the place. You read stories, you meet characters. What better illustration of grace, the grace, the grace of the father than the prodigal son? The father who welcomes him, welcomes him back and throws a huge party where there's music and dancing, says the scriptures. That's what offended the older brother. I don't like this. Tough Rocco's, that's the kingdom. Music and dancing. What greater example of grace? But for instance, the word grace is never once used in that story. If you were just looking for the word grace in your concordance, to look up some verses on grace, you would never come up with that example. So he doesn't just write a book that can be thumbed through to find our key verse. He writes a book that we live with the characters, the stories, we're in relationship even as we look at the print on the page. And then ultimately when he reveals himself, he doesn't reveal himself as the word made print, he reveals himself as the word made flesh. God says, all right, all right, all right. I know, I know that you need to be able to pass a book around, get your information straight, but don't you dare detach that from relationship. And ultimately, when I reveal myself, I am not going to write a book to you. I'm not going to give you a gospel tract and have you go into your closet and read it. I am going to reveal myself through a, I'm going to embody myself. I'm going to take the message and put it into a body that you have to relate to. And so 1 John 1.18, if you have it, check it out. It's my favorite verse in, uh, in the Gospel of John. 1 John 1.18 says, No one has ever seen God at any time. He is that spirit that we just often find very mysterious. But, he says, the one who has revealed him is the only God who is in the bosom of the Father. The bosom of the Father. Some translations will say in the side of the Father, in the heart of the Father, or as close to the Father. The Greek is literally in the chest cavity of God. It says that the only one who has shown us God is the God who is in the chest of God. And it says he has explained him, perhaps your translation will say. It's the Greek word exegeo, from which we get the word exegete. Jesus exegetes God to us, which means to explain. And we go through scripture, we say we're exegeting the scriptures. Well, it says the only way, the ultimate way we get to know God is by looking at the God within God who comes out of his chest, who exegetes God to us. This is the clearest picture of God we'll ever get. This is God embodied, God enfleshed. He has explained him to us, exegeo, exegeted God to us. So when God says, I want to show you my heart, he doesn't write a book, he gives birth to a person. You know, he opens up his chest cavity and his word, his word, word means a, like a message, my message to you, like when we say, excuse me, can I have a word with you? We don't just mean word, like I have a word with you, cat. You know, and then walk away. We don't just, I mean word. We mean there's some, a message I want to give you, right? So the word made flesh. When he says, I have, God says, I want to have a word with you. Here's my word. Here's my heart for you. And when he opens up his heart, a person walks out. 
Because God is so thoroughly relational. He despises any mechanism that would take the place of relationships, so the Bible should not. It should actually enhance our relationships. Right? So, that, so we come together and we listen to each other. We listen to the scriptures because the Spirit ties it all together. At our church at the Meeting House, uh, we come out of more of a, a Mennonite Amish background. We're like Mennonites minus the horse and buggies. We're all right. Woo. Yeah, like, you know, we're, we're kick butt Mennonites. Absolutely. We're, we're urban dwelling Amish. But it, it also means that we, we kind of sit politely and we don't say a lot of amens, hallelujah, glory. So I just want you to know that I appreciate being verbal together. Because I, I, I was raised Pentecostal. So, I mean, it was a great Pentecostal church, kind of a church, you know, you need to wear sneakers to Sunday service to get a good grip on the wall. We had a lot of stuff going. It was good. It was good. It was good. And now the meeting house, we're just a little more subdued. And I, I used to think, yeah, I used to think that every different style was, well, you know, our denomination was in the center. We talked about this in the workshop. And every other one was, the further away they were from us, the further they were away from being the way they should be. I used to think that, but now I just realize we've all got our differences and we all do it in a different way, but as long as Jesus is at the center, Jesus is in the center, we're all, we all learn from each other. Do you know denominational differences can be our greatest weakness or our greatest strength? And, and we can, in one generation, turn our greatest weakness into our greatest strength just by a heart shift. So the diversity among us, if we see it as competitive or, well, they don't have the spirit as much as we do, or they got too much of the spirit. Have you seen how crazy they get? Well, you know that they really don't have a liturgy. They don't have form, and without form, it's never going, they have so much form, it's killing them. And, they have, and if once our heart sees our differences as somehow competitive, then it becomes a huge division within the body of Christ. We can shift that one generation and say, actually, our diversity is our strength. You don't like our church? Go to that church. Same Jesus, different style. That's cool. That's great. We're so resilient. We have different approaches to celebrating the same Jesus. I love that. But I just want to say I also really love this approach. <laughs> it's just nice to be here. So all of this was my introduction. It had nothing to do with what I was actually going to talk on tonight. But I had to get that off. I know. When you're with the charismatics, you get to go with the flow. <laughs> At the meeting house, they'd be saying, that's not slide number three. That's not slide number three. That's not, uh, I don't know. Uh, Brexy, uh, what are you doing? <laughs> oh, yeah, partnership. We were talking about partnership. That's right. So there's this amazing word in the New Testament, koinonia. Maybe you've seen it up there. Koinonia, which often gets translated fellowship when we talk about fellowship. Remember, we are made in the image of a relational God. We can't help but be relational. God wants to be relational through us. He opens up his heart, gives us a relational revelation. Oh, and by the way, just to close that loop, the body of Christ becomes a relational revelation. It is no accident and it is not just pure poetry that then the church is called, what? The body of Christ. The church is the continual, continued steward of the revelation of God. It's not, well, the Bible's over there, go read it. It is, here's the church, we are the body of Christ, come in and join us. We'll look at the book together, but you will be part of a community. It's all about relationship for God. Always, always, always. And so this word koinonia comes up. Sometimes it's translated fellowship. Fellowship. And that means like face-to-face, -face, spiritually enriching friendship. Fellowship. But the word koinonia actually originally comes from the business realm in Greek culture. And it means partnership. First in business. It meant two people coming together, not for face-to-face, -face, I really love you, I really love you, I want to affirm in you your gifts. Well, thank you. And I really challenge you with your... It's not face-to-face. It's, buddy, we got to get something done. Let's link arms. Let's go. Right? So it's, it's, it came from the business world, two people coming together as business partners to accomplish something together. And the Apostle Paul uses that word that way. In Philippians 1, he says, I really value your partnership in the gospel. Partnership in the gospel. Same word, koinonia. So it's used both ways. Both are true. So there's face-to-face -face and shoulder-to-shoulder. -shoulder. Koinonia. Partnership. Face to face and shoulder to shoulder. And we need a balance of both within our Christian communities. We need times when we are in each other's face and we are relating deeply and intimately in Christ. And then we need time when we say, all right, enough with that. We need to now turn together shoulder to shoulder and go and accomplish something together. Both are part of the partnership that God calls us to regularly. And so if we move forward, let's take a look at the next slide. You will see here's my thesis as I am getting ready to begin my message for tonight. 
My thesis is this. Whenever God decides to do something, his very next thought is, now who can I do this with? Whenever God decides to do anything, his very next thought is, now who can I do this with? And we see this consistently in Scripture from Genesis to Revelation. That's my thesis. Let's see if we can bear it out. Next slide. Just to explain the thesis a little bit, I used to think that what we were called to do in partnership with God is pray, and we are. But that was, that was as big as my idea of partnership got. I pray God does stuff. I pray harder, God does more stuff. Pray super hard, God does crazy good stuff. I pray God does stuff. What a small view of partnership. Prayer is certainly central to what we're called to do, but God actually values us so much that when we're face to face with God, having that kind of koinonia, talking to him, uh, praising in the spirit, and, and, and praying for various things, healings, miracles, etc., there are times when we are asking for things, and he says, that's great, thank you for the face to face time, now let's get shoulder to shoulder and go do it together. God is so about relationship, he's not going to say, thank you for this time of prayer and this time of praise. I got your order, thank you, written it down, I'll get on that. And then he goes, he never takes off on his own. Everything God does, he wants to do in relationship. And whenever he has a thought or a plan, his very next thought is, now who can I do that with? Now who can I do that with? And so what I realized is that when I was younger, I used to grow up thinking that if God was really on his A game, He'd be showing up in our midst and he'd be doing all kinds of amazing stuff while we watch and go, that's awesome. And that would be the end. And then we would leave. Now that is awesome and that is good, but is that necessarily his A game or his A game when he transformed lives and then we all go together and we do stuff together? Right? See, God doesn't just want spectators who applaud and who pray and who talk about, but, so I used to think, I used to think that God's plan A was when he rolls up his sleeves and he gets stuff done. And if his plan A doesn't work, you know, I pray for the salvation of my friend, I pray, I pray, I pray, I pray, I pray, God go save him, and I would think plan A would be like something awesome, my friend in the middle of the night is woken up by an angel of the living God who convicts, uh, convicts him and he the next morning comes and says, I got saved in the middle of the night and I don't even know what hit me and I have no doubt anymore and God is, and I'd say, that's really, God's going to keep praying because that would be plan A. And if plan A doesn't work, maybe God will move on to plan B, which is me. I'm God's plan B. If my friend is depressed, I'd say, well, God, I'll pray, I'll pray. And God's plan A is that you, you make sure that you get them, God, you go and you heal and you do and you do and you do. And that is good. That is a great plan. But I was using God, my understanding of how God worked, to absolve me of responsibility to be involved in the healing process. And what I have realized from Scripture, and I am about to, I think, drive the point home with Scripture. Right now, you just have to trust me. But you only have to trust me for a couple more minutes because the Bible will prove I was right all along. What, what I want you to trust me on right here is that we are God's plan A. And sometimes when we are not doing our part, God will say, all right, you guys are not doing it, and I really want that person to hear the gospel, so I will go and appear to them in the middle of the night, or I will go and do this, but that's not my plan A, that's my plan B, and I'll shift over to plan B if that's what it takes to get it done. But I want to first and foremost do it with you, with you. People are God's plan A, people are God's plan A. So with that in mind, let me, next slide, introduce you to a couple of scriptural principles. First of all, the principle of mixed up grace. Grace is not just something that saves us, it saves us. It is God's empowering presence. It's his, it's his, um, it's his nourishing power that helps us become all that we're to, be, to become to accomplish what we need to accomplish in partnership with him. It is not just something that happens to us when we're saved. It is something that we live by daily. It manifests itself in fruit. It manifests itself in gifts. It manifests itself in unity and in fellowship and in a centrality of Christ that, that moves our hearts. Grace, and this is, the, this is an amazing commitment to God's grace. God wants everyone to have a manifestation of his grace, and he wants different forms of grace to be ministered to different people. And what is interesting, though, is though according to 1 Peter 4.10, he doesn't give everyone the grace that he only wants that person to have. He gives everyone somebody else's grace. And then says, now go find each other. And so we read here, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. Catch this now. This is huge. 
as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. You are a steward of God's grace to be given to others. And each of you has somebody else's grace. Each of you has a gift, an ability. You have a character trait, the fruit of the Spirit. You have a presence about you that can encourage someone else. He gives you each other's grace and says, now you'll function best when you find each other and you're all stewarding. This is God's grace. It could say, you know, and, and I want each of you to realize and stand back and watch the amazing presence of God as I individually minister to all of you. But he says, no, I actually want you guys to minister, and, th and I'm going to give you my grace. Now, you steward it out. You manage it as you offer it to each other. So his grace comes down and is designed then to flow out. So the grace that I have is not just for Bruxy. The grace that I have is to be shared with you. And then I come in openness saying, what grace has God given you to share with me? Everything about God is about relationship. Because whenever he has a thought of something he wants to accomplish, his very next thought is, now who can I do this with? Have I made my point yet from Scripture? No, you're letting me off too lightly. Let's continue. <clears throat> Next slide. There's some more. They actually have nothing to do with what I'm talking about. It's just to impress you. No, no, let's take a look at these now. That is, that is small. If you want to know the references afterwards, uh, well, I'll walk through some of these. First of all, Adam and Eve. Start in the book of Gen 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 Genesis. <clears throat> You know, that old thing. Genesis begins with God creating in partnership. Have you noticed? Once he has created one human being in his image, once he's created in his image, he will do nothing else without involving human beings in the partnership process. Isn't that amazing? He doesn't even create one other human being without involving the one being who's already in his image. Because it's a huge commitment for God to say, I am now going beyond just making pets to making people. I am now going beyond just making creatures. You know, he just didn't want a petting zoo. This is really pretty and all. But I'm going to take the risk of, among all these animals, creating one being that has my image and my likeness. And once he has done that, for us to have his image and his likeness and to exercise it, we are to be co-creators with God. And so he makes us, and then he says, now I am not going to make another individual without involving you. That's wild. So, so he creates Eve. Now, remember, Adam, he created out of the dust of the ground. Notice, though, he doesn't then say, and now I'll make Eve over here out of the dust of the ground and get them to meet each other. Once he has made one image bearer of the divine, he does nothing else outside the partnership. So he creates Adam, and now he's committed. Adam, you and I are going to create Eve. Then together you will create, and they will create, and they will create. So Adam, you go to sleep. I'm going to take out a rib. I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to make Eve out of you. Together, you will make others out of yous. I'll create Eve. I will bring her to you. And what will you say? And, it, you know, it says that when Adam woke up and they're like naked and unashamed, he meets her, he, he names her. He calls her woman because I think when he saw her, he went, whoa, man. And he says, this is amazing. This is amazing. Even then, he is getting Adam to exercise his creativity. There's this story in Genesis where a Adam is called to name the animals. Isn't that wild? Why? Why name the animals? It's like God says, I made you in my image. You're, you're, you're created creative. You were designed to create. So go ahead, flex your creativity muscle. Name some animals. Just think of words off the top of your head. We'll make it official. I heard one speaker, and there's Rob Bell talking about, isn't that such a peculiar passage in the Genesis account? As though God just had Adam stand there, and the animals were going to parade past, you know, two by two. And then, no, that's another story. One by one, and then he would just think of a name for them. And God would say, hey, that's my boy. You're exercising your creativity muscles. And you can see him at the beginning of the day. The morning starts early, and God brings by the first animal. And he's like, uh, hippopotamus. <laughs> and God and the angels are over here going, I don't know. I, I said he could, you know, whatever he wants. Okay, all right, sure. <laughs> Next one kind of hops along, and he's like, duck build platypus. You know, it's a long day of just exercising creativity muscle. By sunset, they're almost done, the animals. Last dog's come along. You can tell that, you know, his creativity quotient is lessened, and finally he's just like, I don't know, like, dog. Um, you know, and God's over here, the angel's going, wait a second, that's my name, backwards. Whoa, head trip. You know, and then, and then Adam sees a, the last animal wander by, and he goes, uh, cat. You know, and God says, wait, I didn't make those. Hold on. What, anyway, so you have this... 
Surely I jest. Surely I jest. All right, so then Adam and Eve are made, and what happens after that? God wants to populate the world with billions of individuals. If God wanted a world populated with billions of individuals, he could have created what? A world populated with billions of individuals. And instead he only makes two and goes, okay, tag team. You go, you go. I gave you the plumbing. No, really, you can do this. You can make people. You can make people. Have you ever thought of how crazy that is? That God gives us the power to, to create human life? To reproduce? Isn't that like some kind of Frankenstein freaky thing? Has that not ever hit you as weird? That two people can go into a laboratory together? <laughs> and create life! What an amazing power. It's a, it's, you have to admit, it's kind of a godlike power, is it not? That you can create a human being. You can call a, a soul out of non-existence into existence. You can reach into the realm of nothingness and beckon a human being into the realm of somethingness. You can take one who is not and call them as one who is. This is the you say, well, that sounds like God. Yeah, he kind of made you in his image and in his likeness, and he has delegated certain partnering responsibilities with you. You are not God, but you are like God. That's the biblical teaching. Reproduction, man, you can make human beings. And you can, and how do you do it? <laughs> Speaking about our theme. When it comes to partnership, when it comes to relationship, isn't it fascinating that God, after he makes Eve out of Adam, from then on he says, now you will not individually have this power again. The height of your human creative potential you will never be able to accomplish by yourself. You cannot do it on your own. And you say, well, maybe the thought never occurred to God. Of course it occurred to God. It's asexual reproduction is a fact of nature. If he wanted to, if he wanted to keep it neat and tidy without all the relational complications, he could have designed you to reproduce by budding. <laughs> now, you're taking biology. You know how it goes. You'd hit puberty, and you'd develop a nodule on your navel. <laughs> your insy would turn into an outsy. And over the nine months, something would grow. People say, I see you with child. Yes, I am. Should be popping off any time now. Don't need anybody else, just me. That's what happens. But no, God says you have this amazing power to create human life, and you will do so. This is how he designed it. And you will do so only in the context of the committed, I will die for you, love relationship of till death do us part partnership. When you do that, you enact here in the flesh realm, you enact what is true about God's love for us. And so he says, you can be this, and you can display this to the world. Now we know that since sin has corrupted so many things, our greatest area of human creativity, potential, and delight is also our greatest area of pain, corruption, and torment. But we need not give in to that. We can be the people who celebrate the way it should be, the way it was intended to be, and the way it is going to be. And so right now we begin to live as God's kingdom people. Here and now, and our sexuality becomes redeemed by God. We get a vision for the goodness of what it should be, and we do not define righteousness then as, well, don't do this. Well, don't do that. Don't, 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 don't. Back ourselves into the corner of don'ts, but rather we're the people who say, I'm sorry, I will not be satisfied with this world's cheap imitation of how sex should be used. Do you not see God's glorious vision for what I can do with my body and my soul and my spirit and my heart and my mind in partnership with another person? I can do more than just, you know, I can do more than just to have babies. I can create, I can create a loving display of God's heart for us. God still wants to enflesh his word in partnership not just through scripture, but we read the scripture in community, then we have flesh and partnership. Marriage 
Having babies, these are all analogies God uses. And remember, God doesn't come along and say, let's see, what's an analogy I can use? Well, let's see, I see you have father-son relationships, so I'll say I'm like a father. Um, I really love you guys. I wonder if you have any relationships down there that will help me demonstrate that. Oh, you know what? I love you like a husband loves his wife, and I want you to love me as a bride loving her husband. That's a good one. I'll use that. God didn't come along and look at our relationships and say, what analogy can I use? He started with reality and then crafted our relationships to reflect that. Marriage, birth, friendship, parenthood. These are not just handy examples that God uses. He designed our relationships to reflect his core reality of how much he loves us. When we live our relationships out well, we are partnering with Jesus as the body of Christ to continue to be the word made flesh. The word made flesh to reveal that to others. Scripture becomes our guide. In the center, we gather around. We gather around. And so, uh, I mean, so God gives us this amazing thing of sexual reproduction. By the way, have you lost your fascination with, shek, with sex and with sex? Has it just become, <laughs> has it just become too mundane? You know what's really funny is when I speak on Sundays at the meeting house, I always chew gum. And then earlier I heard your announcement, and I'm like, uh, well, that kind of spoils that plan. So I'm sorry I'm a little, 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 but I chew gum because it keeps me from being, um, you know, gagging. But... Uh, um, <laughs> But, uh, but anyway, but I do have the water, you know, God invented water too, didn't he? Um, all right, Mr. Piano Man's going to come up here later and it won't be here. <laughs> all right, good. The carpets are safe. <clears throat> now, I'm not bitter. Have you lost your fascination with sex? For, try and capture this moment. Think back to the first time in your life when you heard where babies come from, the feeling that you had. Better yet, not where they come from, but how they get in there in the first place. Think about that. Think about that crazy, crazy moment when you first heard about it and you had this weird push-me-pull-you of attraction and repulsion. It was that, no way. Mixed with a little, really? <laughs> tell, me, tell me a little more. How does that, how that? No! And then that, no! Hey, really? And you go back and forth, back and forth. Because it is crazy. It's crazy. And it's God's idea. God values partnership through and through. Everything about our lives, everything about our psyche, about our dreams, about our relationships, about how human beings function screams this as we continue to enflesh God's reality. Now that's just Genesis. You move on from that and you have amazing stories in the Bible of God wanting a, want, he wants to bless the whole world, but he doesn't just go and reveal himself to the whole world. He says, I will work with one nation and call that nation to be the light of the world. Two times in Isaiah, Isaiah says, you know, Israel, you're supposed to be the light of the world. I had a plan for you. Israel wasn't living up to its part of the bargain, so God came and he did that through Christ. All, all right. But God said, I want to bless the whole world. Israel was designed to be a blessing of the world. And through Israel's seed, he does bless the world. He could have just gone and blessed the world himself. He does it through partnership. But even to get Israel, he could have just looked for a nation and said, hey, there's a nation called Israel. I'll use you. But instead, he creates Israel through partnership. God wants to create Israel. His very next thought is, now... Who can I do that with? And so he finds this guy called Abram and Sarai. Changes their names and changes their destiny. And then Israel, his nation, gets caught in Egypt. They're enslaved and entrapped. And the Bible says God heard their cry and said, I will rescue them. But how does he rescue them? Does he just say, roll up his sleeves and go down there and say, everybody watch, this is going to be a fun ride? No. Israel is enslaved. God says, I want to rescue them. What is his very next thought? Now, who can I do this with? And he looks down and he finds this guy, Moses, who is uh, in a very interesting situation through his personal history. It's prepared him for the moment. But he certainly doesn't feel up to the task. He has a speech impediment. He has a hard time communicating. So God says, that's fine. He doesn't say, well, I'll pass. He says, well, I'll make you dependent on somebody else. I'll get Aaron to come and help you. But I am working with you. You know I am. And then God gives him things that 
are kind of impressive, but kind of not. Look, your, your, your stick. You see that stick? Yeah, touch it. Ha, 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 it became a snake. I love it when that happens. You see? Did you see yourself jump? That was great. All right, now grab it again. Okay, now it's back to a stick. Go and show that to Pharaoh and, and ask him to let God's people go. And he goes and he shows that to Pharaoh. And then what happens? Pharaoh's magicians do the same thing. He's like, oh, well, that wasn't as easy as I thought. Well, he says, well, you know, turn the water into blood. Well, they can do the same thing. Well, all right, and plague after plague after plague. And finally, Pharaoh's like, all right, all right, you can go, you can go. And they say, no, no, psych, not really. Come back, come back, come back. And thing after thing after thing is just borderline miraculous that people can say, well, maybe this is the God of, of Israel, Yahweh, he's punishing us, or maybe they're just a lot of gnats this time of year. I don't know, man. I don't, I'm not totally convinced. It goes on and on. Do you realize it's very inefficient? Because by the end of the story, you realize that God himself can appear as a pillar of fire. And I read that and I think, didn't it dawn on you you could have started with that? <laughs> the story would go, God says, I hear my people's cries. I want to set them free. I can do the whole pillar of fire thing really well. Watch! Watch! And he'd go straight to Pharaoh, and he'd be this like floating, hovering pillar of fire coming across his court towards his throne. I don't know what that was. That was my best pillar of fire sound. As it moves towards Pharaoh, and Pharaoh is like, you can go, you can go, what the freak, you can go. But instead, it's, look, your, your stick can go to a snake on any of water and blood. Oh, look, there's frogs. And, oh, no, we'll do this, raining hail. I wonder if. And he goes through all this. It's very inefficient. But God doesn't want to say, everyone stand aside. Look what I can do. Look what I can do. Look what I can do. God wants to do something. He wants to do it through partnership. Now, this is important. Do you realize that, and I'm, I'm only looking at a few, a few ex a stories in Scripture. Do you realize that as you go through all of this, you realize how inefficient it was for God to try and bless the world through Israel and how wayward his people were and how inefficient he was to try and free them through Moses and how, some, how uncooperative he was at times and how uh, Moses, or Pharaoh wouldn't listen to. And do you realize that God so values relationship, he values it even more than efficiency? God is not just about getting the task done. He is about the relationship itself as the ultimate task. There is nothing we have to do more than we have to simply be God's kids. And then as God's kids, we do things together. And you know there's a way of doing things for task and there's a way of doing things for relationship. God's always about relationship. So yeah, mom wants to bake some cookies because company's coming over later and she has to get them done fast and they're going to be coming soon and they said they love her homemade cookie recipe and they want to see it. So what does she say to Junior? Junior, stay out of my way because I've got to get some cookies done. And it's all about efficiency and she, gotta, she puts a video on, she does whatever. That's if it's about efficiency. But God is more like the mom who says, I actually don't give a rip about the cookies. I want to I build a memory maker right here, right now. Junior, come into the kitchen. We're going to make cookies. We are going to make cookies. And Jesus is like, I can do cookies. <laughs> and get the, get the stool. You get up here and we're going to crack some eggs. I, I cracked the eggs. And Junior's like, Kh. eggs are messy. <laughs> and like, scoop that up. That's okay. No, don't lick it. Just scoop it up. That's it. Put it in there and then dump this. Dump, dump that. Oh, that's a lot. All right, we'll make up for it. Put some sugar in. No, that's salt. All right, it'll be okay. And then <laughs> here, we're going to, and you know, you make some batter. Is it about getting the cookies made? No, it is actually about the process of mom and junior doing this together. They're living life. Why do families exist? To accomplish something? They exist to be a family. Being a family is our ultimate purpose. And then we have micro purposes that we do. We, our purpose is to have a job. Our purpose is to make our bed. Our purpose is to do the chores, to wash the dishes. But those are micro purposes. The macro purpose of a family is simply to be a family, to love one another, to do things in relationship. And God, and then you know it comes time to like stir the batter, and Junior's like, I can stir it, I can stir it. And he can't stir it. He's like, mm mm, mm. And Mama doesn't say, get out of the way. What does she do? She lets him try and try and try, and then she comes alongside him. 
and she wraps her arm around him and she puts her hands over the same wooden spoon and Junior's stirring and she's stirring. She's providing the power. She's providing the strength and he's enjoying the creativity. He's enjoying the moment of partnership and right then, right there, that memory, that lasts for years. That's a moment of togetherness, a moment of partnership that is what it is all about and it's better than any batch of the best chocolate chip cookies that you ever tasted. And God says, you know what, I know you guys are really inefficient. That's 2,000 years, I'm still hoping you're going to do the whole Great Commission thing. But I'm committed. I'm committed for doing it with you. And he wants us to acknowledge how beautiful a thing it is that God wants to partner with us. Can I say a couple more things before we close? Yeah, you're Pentecostals. You'll go longer. Um, yeah, you can. Well, you know, you're not Pentecostal, Pentecostal, not with the official P, but you got the spirit, that's what I'm saying. All right. When, all through Israel's history, you got the same thing. God has a message for Israel. What does he do? He says, I've got something I want Israel to hear. What's his very next thought? Now, who can I do this with? So he calls a prophet. He calls Elijah. He calls Jeremiah. He calls Ezekiel. He gets one guy out there talking to Israel, and sometimes Israel listens, sometimes they don't. But it doesn't matter. God is doing it in partnership. Then New Testament comes, you have John the Baptist, you have Jesus who comes, and then let's go to the next slide. You have, do you guys have, have, have Bibles? Open them to Matthew 9, verse 37 to 38. Matthew 9, verse 37 to 38. There's a lot of verses here, but I won't go through them all. I will just look at the first one for the sake of time. And you then can look up the others and see. Matthew 9, verse 37 to 38. In verse 36 we read that Jesus sees people that are harassed, they're helpless, he has compassion for them, they're distressed, they're dispirited, they're like sheep without a shepherd. Now, that's a moment where I'm sure Jesus says, I can help, I can help, let me at them. And he could. By the power of his spirit, he could immediately invest in every life and change where they're at. But he holds back because that's just not the DNA of God. That's not how he works. He sees that there is great need out there, people like sheep without a shepherd. And so he, what does he do? He turns to his disciples. He turns to his disciples and he says this. The harvest is plentiful. It's ready. It's robust. It's ripe. The harvest is plentiful, but there is a problem. What is the problem? The laborers or the workers are few. Now, before we read the next verse, catch this. Jesus is not saying that, unfortunately, there's just not, it's just, there's just not enough readiness for a harvest. So what you need to do is pray that God gets a harvest ready. That's not actually what he teaches. He teaches that the harvest is ready, that if God is going to go and convict hearts and get them ready to hear the gospel, he's not going to give them the gospel. That's your part. But he's going to go and get them ready for the gospel. The harvest is ready. What is the problem? He says the problem is that the laborers, the workers are few. If that's true, then how does that affect our prayer? Next verse. Verse 38, he says, Therefore, you should pray that the Lord of the harvest will send out workers or laborers into his harvest field. I was raised, and maybe you have too, to say that if we really care about evangelism, if we really care about evangelism, here's the prayer we will pray. Oh, God, move through this land and bring in a harvest. Oh, God, fall upon my friends, my family. God, bring in a harvest. And we say, yeah. Except Jesus says, the harvest is already ready. You're praying for God to go and do the God part that God has already gone and done. If the harvest isn't coming in, you don't have to pray for God to go and do more God stuff. 
Because God's really good at doing the God stuff, and he's already doing it. The problem in the equation is that not enough of us are catching the vision for partnership with what God is already doing. And so he says, you know what, if you're going to pray, here's what you should pray. Not for God to go doing the God thing, because God's doing the God thing. You should pray for you to go and do the you thing, because you're not doing the you thing. So he tricks us. Which isn't really a trick because he's telling us. He tricks us by saying, I want you to pray. Ready? Here's what you pray. I want you to pray that you will get out of the chair and get out the door and go tell people about Jesus. He gets us praying for ourselves that we will become the answer to our own prayers. He gets us pray once again. Oh, God, would you please go and... Uh... Oh, wait, no, that's not what I'm supposed to... What is that? I... God, please get the workers out the door to go and bring in God let's have another prayer meeting to pray that we would oh wait that's us <laughs> amen <laughs> and sometimes the most spiritual word that we can pronounce from our lips in a time of prayer is amen now go and do now go and have the privilege of becoming the answer to your prayer that God wants to work with you in partnership this is the great commission Go into all the world, make disciples. Who makes disciples? He doesn't say go into all the world and watch. I'll make disciples. <laughs> go into all the world and make disciples. Baptize in the name, Father, Son. And then he said, hello, I'll be with you always. Behold, I'll be with you always. A partnership. I'm part of it. I'm there. I'm with you. Next slide. Next slide. I was going to exegete all of Acts 17, but I think we'll pass. <clears throat> Next slide. Let me just say this, when you go, when you go, know that it will be hard and you may be persecuted. Look at Christ's disciples. Hardships in life are not necessarily a sign that your faith is weak or, or that you're doing something wrong. I mean, Jesus kind of lived a perfect life and it, it was pretty rough. His disciples died horrifically. The early Christians underwent all kinds of horrible torment. This is the earliest known Christian graffiti that we have, or, not, or the earliest known anti-Christian graffiti that we have. It's found on the wall of the a page boys' residence in Rome, where the page boys would live. Uh, they had jobs. They'd live away from their parents in, like, these bunkhouses, and they would serve some of the Roman senators, etc. and where the page boys live. So these might be teenagers. They might be young men. Where they lived... This is what we find carved into one of the stone walls. It's like graffiti at summer camp, carved into the bedpost. It is a picture of a boy paying homage to worshiping, praising, revering, a apparently crucified man with the head of a donkey. So it's making fun. It's mockery. And it it says in the Greek writing, if you can read that at the bottom, Alexamenos, which is the name of the boy, Alexamenos worships his God. We don't know a lot about little Alexamenos, but here was someone who had obviously been forthright about his faith, and his was a faith that became mocked. He's away from his family. He is living with guys in Rome who see him as something to laugh at. But he stood by his faith enough to be known as the guy who worships the crucified Messiah with the head of a donkey. Let's laugh at this. From the very beginning, being a follower of Christ was not the easy road. But it was a road of deep, enriching partnership with our maker. And so it's worth it all. Lastly, the next slide. I want to end with this illustration. Uh, I have a chapter that walks through this in the book. If you've read The End of Religion, this will be familiar to you. But it asks us the question, now that we know we're called to partnership, can I just stop and do a heart check tonight before we close and say, am I ready to just run out the door and do stuff? Or am I really celebrating the intimacy that God calls me to? I've talked a lot tonight about shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder partnership. 
the, the, the fellowship of koinonia that says let's link arms and let's get things done. That's been my emphasis. Now I want to close by reminding us about the face-to-face. God wants both. And sometimes it's possible to get so lost in doing this stuff that we forget that God has called us to do, do it with him. Right, like little junior kicking mama out of the kitchen because we think we can make the cookie so well. And we forget it's really about the partnership. Let me introduce you to Bob and Sue Pruneberger. They'd been married for a few years. The relationship was fine. Their marriage was fine, fine, fine. It was just fine. As many marriages get after a few years, got a couple of kids, it's fine. Mind you, it was Sue because it is usually the woman who's a little more intuitively wired, relationally connected, who comes to Bob and says, Hey, Bob! Bob, do you remember how you used to really, you know, romance me? How, you remember how you really used to show me how important I was to you? Do you remember how you used to treat me like I was something special? You used to woo me, love me. Do you remember that? And Bob says, in wonderfully scripted male dialogue, like what? And she says, you know, I used to do things. I don't want to tell you because I don't want to instruct you. I don't want to tell you to go and do it. I want, I want you to come up with the idea. And he's going, well, like what? And she says, well, I'm not going to tell you. I want you to think of it. I want it, to be, it used to be spontaneous. It used to be planned. It used to be all these things. I'll roll into one. It gave me a great feeling. Can you please go and do what you used to do? Uh, you know, return to the things you did at first. Don't forget your first love. Uh, writes Jesus to one of the churches, right? And so, and so Bob says, well, all right, I'll, you know, I'll, give, I'll give it. All right, sure. All right, great. <clears throat> Then, that Tuesday, about 6.30, doorbell rings. Ding dong! Sue Prunebottom goes to the door, opens it up, and there is little Levicka Trickleson, their babysitter. The poorly named babysitter, Levicka Trickleson. And Sue says to her, Levicka, uh, it's Tuesday night. I didn't book you. What are you doing here? And Levicka says, oh, no, I know you did it. Mr. Prunebottom booked me. Bob? Bob called the babysitter on his own. He comes walking in. That's right, honey, we're going out on a date. Levicka, come on in. The kids are already ready. Supper's over there in the kitchen. Sue, I want you to go upstairs and put on whatever you want to wear, whatever you feel the most sexy in, whatever makes you ready for a hot night on the town. Come on down the stairs, and we are out of here. So she goes upstairs. She has her whole wardrobe. She picks that little red number that is hot, hot, uh, hot. She comes down the stairs. Mm, 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 mm. Bob is like, waka, 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 let's go. They get in the car. Yes. They drive into the parking lot of this little, it's not like a standard chain Restaurant. It's this little out-of-the-way Italian restaurant that you obviously had to do some research to find. Beautiful little place. They get out of the car. They walk in. The maitre d' greets them. Oh, Mr. Mrs. Prunebad, I'm right this way. Walk this way. Your table's ready. Which is an outrageous French accent, a little Italian restaurant. But I don't know. Just go with it. Then he brings them to their table. And when they get there, Sue sits down. And she notices there's a place card there on her table. Bob has already been there earlier. He's been intentional. He's been creative. She opens up the place card. And she begins to weep tears of joy as she reads through what he has written. Because it's, it's a girly card. It's not a boy card. You know what I'm talking about? It's a, you know, it's a girl card where you open it up. And it's like, ah, it's blank. And you got to write stuff. Guy, a guy card is like, Hallmark writes it all, and we sign it. I really mean it. Love, Bob. Right? But this is a girly card. Big old blank page that he's got to think of, and, he, and they're observant things. They're beautiful things. I watch you with the kids. I watch you as a stately woman and a beautiful wife, and I see, and I remember how, and it moves her to tears, and she is so wowed by this. He says, order whatever you want. Order whatever you want. They have a beautiful meal, candlelight and wine. And candlelight and chocolate milk if you're an abstainer. And then, by the end, they have a beautiful dessert. Not quite the same ambiance, but then he reaches under the table and he offers her what he has planted there earlier, a single blue rose, because it has rich symbolic meaning to their relationship and nothing says romantic passion like a single blue rose. And let me tell you, that week, they've got it on. <laughs> that week, passion, romance. Genuine affection, delight, the spunk of marriage is back again. Bob is back. Sue is back. They got it going until next Tuesday, 6.30. Ding dong. Sue goes to the door. <gasps> Levicka, don't tell me. Two weeks in a row, Bob comes in. That's right, honey. Levicka, come on in. We're going out again. This is too good to be true. 
Sue goes upstairs, I'll put something on. Bob says, yeah, can you put on the exact same dress you wore last week? Sue says, okay, that's a little creepy, but I'll do it. She puts on the dress, she comes down, where are you taking me? Oh, it's a surprise. They drive around, they drive, they pull into the parking lot of the same little out-of-the-way Italian restaurant. All right, he doesn't get bonus marks for creativity, but at least he's trying. They get out of the car, walk in the door, ah, oh, Mr. and Mrs. Brumbrotten, I still have this outrageous French accent, come this way. They sit down at their table, she's got a card there, she opens it up, and Bob has written the exact same stuff that he wrote last week, Bob. I'm not going to cry now. I'm just going to shiver a little bit at how creepy you're making me feel. Then Bob orders the meal. It's the same meal as last week. At the end of the meal, he reaches under the table, and what do you think he pulls out? A single blue rose, because nothing says romantic passion like a single blue rose until next Tuesday. They have a fine week, a fine week till next Tuesday at 6.30. Ding dong. Livica, how are you? Bob, come on, let's go. Put on the same dress. I'm taking you to a... They sit down here. Same card, same meal. Blue rose. Ah. Next Tuesday, 6.30. Ding dong. Next Tuesday, 6.30. Ding dong. Next Tuesday, 6.30. Ding dong. Week after week, month after month, year after year. And if you wanted to figure out what's going on with their marriage and you had a chance to interview Bob and Sue separately, if you took Sue, you took her aside and you said, Sue, how's your marriage, honey? How are things at home? And you took Bob aside and you said, Bob, how's your marriage? How are things at home? What kind of answers would you get from the two of them? From Bob, you might get this answer. Never been better. I learned the secret to romance. She affirmed it the first time I tried it, and I'm sticking with it. In fact, I could write the book on romance. I'm not deviating. In fact, I romance my wife religiously. And then if you talk to Sue and said, Sue, how's your marriage? What might she say? I might say it's boring, I might say it's hard. She might say even something worse. She might, if she felt she trusted you enough, begin to cry and to say, I feel like I've lost him. I feel like he's fallen in love with a tactic and he's forgotten his wife. She might say to you, you know what? I think I feel lonely in my own marriage. I feel trapped and I don't know what to do. And when he looks across the table, he doesn't see me anymore. He just takes pride in his own system that achieves what he thinks it's achieving, and it stopped achieving that a long time ago, but he doesn't know. I, I feel ignored. And sometimes I wonder if for those of us who are the doers, are the doers, are the doers, if we were to interview God and say, hey, God, how's your marriage to the bride of Christ? He might say, I feel like they forgot about me a long time ago. I know that they love me. I mean, deep down inside, their intentions are good, but they found their system and they're sticking with it and they're going through the motions and they're feeling good about it, but they're not checking in with me. And I just want them to come to me. And so I want to invite all of us, especially those of us who are the, yeah, let's get it done, let's do, people, which includes myself, to stop and say, Jesus, have I trapped you in a loveless marriage where I am now the one who has fallen in love with empty tradition? And what's especially dangerous for us who have grown up in charismatic circles and expressive circles is that there's always someone who looks more traditional than us, so we feel like we don't have traditions. I grew up that way. I went, I used, uh, then I realized, hey, wait, our church has a liturgy too. Our church has traditions. There's nothing wrong with, with a program, with a tradition, with a way of doing things. There's nothing wrong with that until you start to just rely on that and call that the relationship. Then there's something wrong with it. I was at an Anglican prayer service with older Anglican people because, well, there just weren't a lot of younger Anglican people at that church. And I remember I sat through half of that Anglican prayer service puffed with pride 
because they were reading their prayers from a prayer book, and they were going through traditions and routines, and I was like, where's the spirit here? And then I looked over and I saw this little old man. He was weeping and calling out to Jesus as he worked through the prayer book, and I said, who all evening has been connecting with God? Him, not me. And I realized that we can make a tradition out of spontaneity. We can make a tradition out of anything. And so some of us say, that's right, that freaks me out. I'll just switch traditions, then I'll be safe. No, if you haven't healed your heart, addiction to the system, you'll take that addiction with you wherever you go. So tonight we pray for healing of the heart. Tonight we pray that when I look across the table at my heavenly husband, I see Jesus, and I want to be closer to him. And I listen, and I adjust, and I'm always ready to be in partnership with him wherever that will lead. The good news is he's not going to divorce you. He's not saying, I'm out of here. It's a loveless marriage. I don't have to take this. Instead, he says, I'm committed to you for life. But wouldn't it be wonderful if it was a life filled with love? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I repent. I repent. I repent of those times in my life when I have fallen into a pattern and I have justified the pattern through pride. I have looked at other denominations' patterns or traditions, seen them as religious, but my own only as freeing. And then in the process, I realize I'm making my own religion out of whatever pattern I have felt proudful about. I repent. I pray that in our worship, in our prayer, in our style of liturgy, in our approach to being the body of Christ, whatever it may be from church to church to church that's represented here, we would be a humbled people. Humbled that we so often fall in love with the system and forget our Savior. May we celebrate the diversity of the body of Christ and also enjoy the particular expression of worship that you have currently called us into in the community in which we dwell. And ultimately, may your spirit blow us, move us towards Jesus, our husband, our lover, our savior, our Lord. In your name I pray, amen. Wow, you could hear like a pin drop in here. Can we give him a huge round of applause? Because I don't know about you guys, but Noel Jordan and I and, and John Shunker, some of the pastors here, we were just sitting together, and we just keep sensing, like, if you could audibly hear the sound of people eating spiritual things, that's what you guys were all doing. I just felt it was like, <gasps> like some of you guys, especially us, especially people who have been through this many, many times before, you guys were just hungry, and thank you so much for cooking up, like, such a buffet for us, Bruxy. It was amazing. Um, we, we feel, as pastors, Jordan was kind of laughing. He goes, uh, your homework tonight, or the ministry tonight is go buy the MP3. <laughs> um, no, but seriously, like, make this applicable. We don't want to, we don't want to, after a message like that, give you a by rope prescription on how to apply this to your life. Amen? Um, I think that each one of you, even sitting here, you're individuals who have God's fingerprint on you, and that means you know what to do with his presence. You know what to do with his little voice that's been nagging at you, and, and our, our challenge to you is go do it. Whatever that is, if you need to write something down tonight so that you can remember it, you know, next week or the week after that, if you need to go and just spend some time with him, if you need to go and like look at your life and figure out the areas where you have hardness in your heart or you just have, you've been doing the, the religious romance over and over and over. I know I have. I was convicted. So pretty sure you all have it too because 
I don't want to be alone in that. <coughs> anyway, you guys are blessed. Um, Brexy is also like, I don't know what it is about us charismatic churches. We're like, wow, he's like on time and we're all fed and it's amazing. There's no catastrophes, nothing is on fire, there's no ambulance. Um, so you're pretty much dismissed to go home. Um, we start again tomorrow at 10 a.m. If you want to come early to re re reserve a seat, you absolutely could and, and are encouraged to, but please don't leave your stuff here overnight because it will be whisked from your seat, so you will lose your seat, you will lose your stuff. It will end up in the Bermuda Triangle known as the Lost and Founds. We love you guys. We love you guys. Go buy Brexy's book also. See you tomorrow.